Right. You ready, Jeff? Yes, I am. Thank okay, you. we're going to open up the hearing on House Bill 686. I'm going to call the prime sponsor, Neil Kirk. Before we start, uh, before we start, uh, I know that this is going to go an hour anyway. Uh, I know that there are a lot of speakers as opposed to people signing up, and I hope that you will express yourself in as uh, short a manner as possible. If you've heard the points made before you, please just uh, know that we have heard them. Uh, so, here we go. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Neil Kirk, representing the towns of Goffstown and Ware, Hillsborough District 7. I'm the prime sponsor of this bill, and along with Representative Marjorie Smith, and in strong support of the version that passed the House. Uh, as you may know, House Bill 203 from 2006 contained and addressed the same subject matter, um, but at the end of the session it was converted into a study commission, the RFID Commission, which is still meeting. The RFID Commission um, has proposed some legislation which is incorporated in 686, but the House went beyond that. Indeed, the House overturned the um, committee the Commerce Committee and um, disagreed with their amendment. Their amendment or their subject to this bill would have simply put into effect the recommendations of the RFID Commission, but the House was persuaded that that didn't go far enough, that there was more to be done to protect New Hampshire citizens. They overturned the committee and adopted um, the bill with a minority amendment to it, and that is the bill that you see before you. RFID chips are now postage size stamped and soon will be smaller than a period and they are and will be everywhere. Companies and laboratories use them as building access keys, Prius owns, owners use them to start their cars, retail giants like Walmart have deployed them as inventory tracking devices. Chips are turning up in computer printers, car tires, shampoo bottles and clothing tags. They're in library books. Companies say the tags improve supply chain efficiency, and they do. Let me make it very clear that this new uh, technology is most desirable, should be encouraged, but to the extent that it adversely affects New Hampshire citizens, some of its uses should be limited, and that's what this bill does. U.S. passports contain RFID chips. The medical industry will soon incorporate them on bottles, and the pharmaceutical industry is going to incorporate them in managing patients in hospital. The federal government is talking about putting them into our currency in every dollar bill, printing them in the ink itself. There are two types of chips, passive and active. Passive is without battery power, and in order to access the information on it, you have to be within, say, 20 feet of it and have a reader device. An active chip, active chips are different. They contain batteries. At the moment, they're not very common because they're more expensive to produce. But an active chip, A, can be read from a greater distance, but B, has the capacity to query the reader and inform the reader that it exists so that, in effect, it can be, an, a person can have his, the information on the RFID chip read remotely and secretly. So if you're concerned about ID theft, this is a perfect way uh, to do that if it is not limited in some sense. An active chip will promote identity theft. Now, these chips, when they're, and they're on track to be embedded in virtually everything we buy, wear, drive, and read, will allow retailers and law enforcement to track consumer items, and by extension, consumers themselves, wherever they go, from a distance. With tags and so many objects relaying information to databases that can be linked to credit cards, almost no aspect of life may be safe from the prying eyes of corporations and governments, says the former head. This is not Kirk speaking. It says the former head, I would wish I had thought of this, says the former head of the Computer Crime Division of the U.S. Justice Department. It's going to be used, quote, it's going to be used in unintended ways by third parties, not just the government, but private investigators, marketers, lawyers building a case against you. Once a tagged item, quote, once a tagged item is associated with a particular individual, personally identifiable information can be obtained and then aggregated to develop a profile, says the U.S. Government Accountability Office in 2005. House Bill 686 is carefully crafted to protect our privacy while allowing businesses to implement beneficial uses of this new technology. For the private sector, 
The amendment does the following. First, it allows all uses of RFID chips except human implantation and tracking. You can't put a chip into a person without their consent or a court order. And you cannot track an individual where he goes without the person's consent or a court order. Thirdly, it prevents skimming. Skimming is the reading of a chip by somebody who is not authorized to do so by the person who placed the chip. So for example, if I were trying to obtain your identity illegally, I would want to read that chip. It is a crime in this bill. We have an anti-skimming provision in this bill. Now, that would not mean the GAP, which put the chip in, couldn't read the chip. The GAP could read the chip because theirs is an authorized use. But skimming, the unauthorized access to these chips, is illegal in this bill. And the other uh, provision that this bill has that affects the private sector is that it requires um, a manufacturer, not a retailer, not a middleman, but a manufacturer to place a notice on every consumer product that contains an RFID chip. Doesn't require anything be done, doesn't prevent the item from being sold or otherwise limited, simply requires notice to the consumer. And, and that's on page 5, line 10, section 4, the consumer notice? Yes. Okay. Well, no. Um, Is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about section 2 of the bill, which is on page 2, line 29. No person shall manufacture a consumer product, etc. The skimming is on page, starts on page 4, section 2 of the bill, line 23. By requiring notice, we make it illegal for a company to place an RFID chip into your new t-shirt, not just its packaging or a removable tag, without telling you. It seems to me that's the very essence of consumer protection. Incidentally, and others may testify to this, um, this will also allow those people who are concerned about stalkers to take protections by eliminating these chips because they can be used improperly and clearly illegally, but nonetheless by stalkers to do a great deal of physical damage to the objects of their affection. There are limitations in this bill placed on state and local governments. There's a ban on using RFID chips in state ID documents such as driver's licenses or driver plates. Uh, there are exceptions for easy pass, state prisoners, secure entry to a public building or parking lot, state-issued credit cards, county nursing homes, and things like this. Mm. To help the committee understand this, I have uh, three articles which, with the chairman's permission, I'd like to give to the committee so that they may um, benefit from these articles. Some of them are national, some of them are, are local. Um, I would also like to submit to the committee an amendment on behalf of the Department of Transportation, which would allow the department to use easy pass to track um, not, not specific vehicles, but to track traffic flow without in any way identifying the individual in the car or the car itself. This is one of the beneficial uses of easy pass, which I think is allowed under the bill, but the department is having some concerns, so I prepared an amendment which would address that issue. Mr. Chairman, if you believe that no one should be able to track your location, where you go, and who you visit, then I hope you will pass this bill. Mr. Chairman, if you think that you should be informed when an RFID chip is placed in your clothing or in any product that you buy or in any credit card that you might ha uh, carry, you should support this bill. Mr. Chairman, if you believe that the state should be prevented from putting RFID chips and driver's licenses and other identification documents that our citizens could carry, then I think you should support this bill. Um, this bill is an extremely important consumer protection and privacy protection bill. The House was very strong in support of this. The vote was 203 to one, uh, 209, I believe, to 121. And uh, 
it's something that I commend to the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be pleased to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two quick questions for you, Representative Kirk. I'm on page 4, line 16, under the penalties. Yes. What is a natural person? I don't understand. Senator, with that kind of an opening, I'm going to be very nice. You and I are natural people, as opposed to corporations, which are artificially created uh, people. That was kind. My second, <laughs> my second, I didn't know you and I were natural. Uh, my second question, uh, nowhere in this bill does it prohibit uh, those uh, black boxes that come in our automobiles to tell Big Brother how fast we're going. Is this a place for an amendment to outlaw those in New Hampshire? If I thought that could have passed, uh, Senator, I would have put it in the bill, but I invite you to do it. I think that's a very important idea. However, please notice that this bill exempts any device which uses RFID technology for the purpose of making the device work. So, for example, your garage door opener, you press it, there's a signal. To the extent that uses RFID technology, that is exempt from the bill because it's of the very nature of the operation of the device. To some extent, those black boxes are fit in both categories. There, some of the information is not necessary to the operation of the vehicle, but to the extent it's necessary to the operation of the vehicle, I invite the Senator's suggestion. I welcome the Senator's suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Kirk, it's a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, just had a question. The notice provisions regarding uh, requiring the manufacturers to put the notice on every consumer product, is that an undue burden uh, under the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution? Is that something that would subject your legislation to some constitutional Commerce Clause challenge? Do you know? Uh, if I were a lawyer arguing the case, Senator, I would bring that up, but I would fully expect the court to either laugh it off or to give it short shrift. It, it's true, it does <coughs> affect interstate commerce, <coughs> but I don't believe in any way that it rises to the level of an undue burden. Well, I, I have to say, I'll interject, I read a case this morning that was presented to me in Colorado that directly, is directly on point, uh, that actually, uh, chat where this was challenged, and they found that it was a violation of the Commerce Clause. So I, I This is I, a Colorado State the Court? Fact that, beg your pardon? Colorado State Court? I don't have the case. I had it, but we're federal, Colorado federal. I, I, I tell you, I'm guessing, but I read it. I thought it was federal, but I didn't know. But we'll figure that all out. But thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Representative Kirk. Thank you. Uh, Senator Clay, I know you have a place to be, so we'd like to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is introduce the letter uh, from EPIC, which is the Electronic Privacy Information Center. I, I asked them to take a look at the bill. They were kind enough to do so and send back the um, information that I think helps. Um, they talk about what happened when the Dutch government uh, announced the security access keys for their RFID chips was compromised. It also in there will talk about a um, number of states who are taking action to safeguard um, the use of RFID technology. And I also want to add my two cents that we've this isn't the first time we've seen this bill. Um, we've seen it a couple of times. And I have to say that I think we need to act. I'm not afraid of technology, but I do know that technology sometimes gets used against us. Neil Kirk, um, Neil Kirk mentioned um, stalker. It certainly could be used for stalkers. Um, and it could be used um, for a number of other things which Neil Kirk has in, in his amendment. Neil and I, always agree on everything, but we're not going to agree on this method. <laughs> this is another method of allowing someone to use the RFID technology to once again put the nose, the camel's nose under the tent. It says in this that they would be allowed to use the signals emitted from our easy pass to figure out average speeds on the highway. So does that mean that if the average speed is 82 miles an hour, they know to dispatch five state police cruisers because we can we can fund some of our deficit by handing out more tickets. I, I think that's likely. And it also, you need to understand that every single one of those transmitter units has a uniquely identifiable number. 
that number also traces back to a uniquely identifiable person, which is us. Now, maybe it's your kid driving your car, but let's face it, once they have the number and they show that it was doing 85 miles an hour down the highway, it's up to you to say, I was driving, my kid was driving, we all know we're not going to say our wife was driving because we have to eat. But there's a number of things that they'll do with that information. And I don't think that we should allow the Department of Transportation to use RFID technology to start tracking citizens of this state, or non-citizens for that matter. So I'm 100% against the amendment. I think we allow them to use easy pass for enough things. When we go through the toll, it records that we were there, at what time we were there, and whether or not we actually had any money in our account. We've stated from day one that we wouldn't allow them to use it for anything else. This is just another backdoor attempt for them to come in. And with all due respect, the city of Manchester came in and asked to use certain technology to trace parking golf laws, and we said no to that. So we should say no to the Department of Transportation and be fair and reasonable and say that your privacy is your privacy and no one should be allowed because of the ease of technology to suddenly be part of your privacy. Um, other than that, Mr. Chairman, I think that on the case of whether or not we violate the Commerce Act, um, perhaps that's best left to me when I get to Congress after this next election. But in the meantime, <coughs> I'd like to say that perhaps we have the local retail merchants somehow notify us as we go into the store or in the areas where they know that there are RFID chips in certain equipment. If there are RFID chips in the televisions, then they can, they can put some kind of a notice that says these televisions are equipped with a radio frequency identifier that is traceable or trackable when you leave the store. At least then people are aware. If they're not aware of something that's, that's in there, then I don't think they can be held accountable. I also think we need to take a look at the drug industry and understand that while in the state of New Hampshire we have a law that says it's illegal for people to scan your licensed magnetic strip and maintain that information, the federal government has said tough to New Hampshire, and when you go to buy things like Sudafed that are kept behind the counter, they scan your license, your, your tag, and they also maintain it in the computer base. Now, you can have one or two things happen. You can just ignore it, or you can, not, or you can do something and not allow those, those products to be sold because the federal government says the only way you can sell them is that way. So I think we need to do some work there and allow any, anything that's already federally controlled as far as marking goes, whatever we do here isn't going to do anything. But I do think that the public should be aware of the extent that the RFID tracking abilities have, including in your clothes. Just imagine if you had something similar to what's in your Easy Pass in your jacket, then maybe DOT or maybe our secretaries want to know where we are and they start tracking it. I mean, that's how, how available the technology is. And while it's illegal to use it, um, I can't stop somebody from, from skimming the information if I don't know that in my clothing or in my vehicle or in my television that I actually have it. So with that, I'll accept any questions. Thank you, Senator Clare. Senator Barnes? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Senator Clegg, what do you think about this black box thing that's in our automobiles? Well, as I remember, Senator, we passed something that said that the black boxes were a part of the manufacturer's ability to see what was being done to the vehicle. But we also made it against the law to use those black boxes in court or for any other purposes other than maintenance and repair of the vehicle. Thank you. I'm pretty sure we took care of that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Senator Quick. I, I did uh, just, uh, is, is, is Kirk still here? No. Okay, uh, just in case he wants to know where it was, we should put in the record. The case I was referring to was bioorganic. Safety Brands Inc. versus AMET, -E 174 Fed Sub 2nd, 1168. That's a uh, district court in Colorado, 2001 case. And in that case, it basically said that if you force New Hampshire, if you force Colorado to label something, uh, especially for them, uh, that it interferes with interstate commerce. And this is part of an opinion letter that was provided to me. But, uh, and I haven't read the case, but uh, that's the information that I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Winters, you wanted to go last, right? Yeah, with your permission. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, Jay, I see you there, right? Still there. Right? 
Sure, close on Jay Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Jay Finnessy. I represent Sullivan District 5, which is exactly Charlestown and Langdon, Sullivan County, obviously. Uh, and I come here not as that representative, but as the chair of the uh, RFID commission. Uh, to say the least, we've been working very hard over the last year. There was a gap of a few months uh, last year during the session. We had a lot of bills. But then we started to pick up the work at the end of the summer and continue to work through. This year, we uh, had all agreed collectively, and that was business and private interest. And I'm going to have you go through the bill very quickly now so you know just exactly what the commission agreed to. And so that if you, whatever the disposition of the bill is. Is that there. different from what uh, Representative Kirk did? Yes, it is. That's why I'd like to have you just go through it. What I'll do is I'll leave you these two hard copies and you can use them as a <coughs> material. And I, I stress this only in that it depends on how you want to dispose of the bill. I would ask you at least pass these parts of the bill through because this is what the commission had agreed to. Thank you for it. That's why I signed up actually in opposition. I'm not in opposition to the concept of it. If you look at the bill, and I'll try and be about as accurate as I possibly can, I'm sure I'll make a mistake. So, just, just so we're clear, there are parts of the bill that we see before us yes. that you want to go through and yes. parts that you do not want to go Well, through. it's not so much that I do not want them to go through. I want the parts that I highlight to go through because that's what the commission had agreed to. And that's what the commission had submitted to the Commerce Committee of the House in order to have them bring it to the floor for approval. Okay. Since then, what you see here, which would be Representative Winters and Representative Kirk, you see an expansion of the policy. You. Thank you. I just thought okay. I had to clear. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. before the representative goes on, can we hear from him who's on the commission? Can I make that oh, I, I would love to tell you that, but I think you'll see a fair representation of the people speaking today. I could get the, I don't have it with me now, but I could get the list of the commission. So you don't know who's on the commission? Yes, I do know who's on the commission, but I'm not going to misspeak. I would rather get the commission. Oh, okay. I understand that it's a cross-section of all the interested parties in this issue. That's Would correct. that be a fair statement? That's correct. Uh, both on the industry and business side, many of those people will be speaking today, as well as private interests. People and individuals. So it's a very good broad process. If you'd like, I'll supply you with that. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Going through the bill, uh, what we had agreed to would be 358T1, which is one, two, the definition of a person. And I believe that you have that in here as well. Um, that would be section five, page two, line 10, going forward. At that point, human implantation is what the commission agreed to. That would be 358T2. Old, which is now 358T3, which is page 3. And that goes through lines 6 through 19. If you mark lines 20 through, I believe, the next page, line 14, that would be new language that was adopted by the House. If you look at 358T6 penalties, that is new, that language. Where, where is that? Uh, page 4. Sorry, line 15. Uh, yes, uh, 15 through 18. Penalties, that's new language. Is in type. Line 19 corresponds with what we had adopted, which was all 358T3. And I will give these to you. And there's slight changes. Uh, line 16 <coughs> the slight changes are in their three on your page four, their three is now up to $1,000 for actual damages, whichever is greater, plus court costs and reasonable attorney's fees, with basically sets for civil penalties up to $10,000 plus court costs and reasonable attorney fees for each violation of this chapter. As opposed to for actual damages? Uh, I believe so. Let me just see. Uh, yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. But you'll have this category. I just want you to be very clear with people talking okay. on both sides of this mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Line 23, Section 2, Illegal Use of Payment Card Scanning <coughs> Devices. If you go all the way to the bottom of that page, there's line 37, is permission language. And if I'm correct, I believe it also follows into the next page, page 
the complete page? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, we will have both of these. Uh, in essence, this commission has worked uh, towards dealing with a lot of these issues on our docket now, and the people will speak behind me, are things such as notification, which we haven't covered yet within the commission and labeling, which we haven't covered yet within this commission. The commission did agree to discuss and deal with labeling and notification, but they were going to take a slightly different approach than this bill. And I believe we were going to be a little bit more flexible when it came to labeling as to whether it was going to be the retailer or the manufacturer. Okay, so this uh, it starts at line 28 on page 2. In your, in your language, in your bill. In our bill, that is the labeling provision. Right. Notice required consumer products, and that is new language. If I'm correct. And that goes over into page 3, line 4. Chairman, the, the definition section you're saying was carried forward and passed. There was no change at all to the definition? Um, yes, there is. And I'll get back to that. The entire first page is a change in definition. All we covered was the definition of person. And then that's on page two, which was chapter <coughs> five, Roman five. And then 19, Roman seven, remotely readable devices. So your bill only contained those? We only discussed person and remotely readable devices. Okay. We have not taken up tracking yet. We're really going to discuss tracking, and we're going to deal with tracking also as it pertains to rental cars and rental agreements. So that was one of the areas that we were going to be going into next. <coughs> uh, one of the important things, and I think that the commission really hit hard on, was what we call T2, but I believe okay. it's human implantation. Yes, what we call T3. Uh, that has not been uh, changed, and we are very insistent upon all the aspects of uh, prohibiting implantation and for the various purposes of discrimination, etc., etc., etc. So, we're very, I would really, whatever you do, I really hope that you would keep these sections in. One of the things that personally I would like to see, if you want to consider it now, uh, I'm going to try and bring it up in the commission, is what I consider a strict liability of a tracking device to put into a credit card where an individual may be harmed as a result of the uh, credit card causing uh, financial loss. And I think that's a very important issue that you all ought to take up and look at. And with that, I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Senator, I'll be glad to get you. I'm looking forward to saying we'll be having about 10 minutes. Mark, roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Mark Brewer. I am the brand new airport director at the Manchester Boston Regional Airport. And I come before you uh, today in opposition of parts of House Bill 686 in its current form. Uh, as background, I've been in the airport management business for 33 years and have worked at airports in six different states. Each of these airports was obligated to have a federally approved airport security program. During several of those 33 years in the airport management business, I was uh, lucky enough to serve on two federal committees, one with the FAA, the Security Equipment Integrated Product Team, or SEIPT. Essentially, the purpose of the SEIPT was to test and distribute new or emerging technologies, which would be used by airports and airlines to make the nation's air transportation system more secure. Certainly after September 11, 2001, aviation security took on a whole new meaning. And the FAA's SEIPT was disbanded and took on a new form under the Transportation Security Administration. This body was comprised of private industry, the airlines, and airports. It was called the Security Technology Deployment Office. I was the only airport member of that team until 2002. Let me assure the committee that I'm not a scientist, nor a big government security fanatic. I'm an airport management professional who must comply with federal security guidelines and mandates. I also have a secret clearance from the federal government and received briefings on threats to aviation on a periodic basis. 
I can assure you that the threats are real. With that said, I have some concerns of House Bill 686 in its current form could limit any air carrier airport in the state from complying with their approved federal security plans. As you know, as indicated earlier, RFID tags could be either passive or active depending on uh, whether or not the tag is actively emitting a signal or is read only in close proximity to a card reader. Manchester Boston Regional Airport currently employs RFID technology in our security, our, our existing security ID badging system. In particular, when proximity with the card reader, we can not only control access to specific security doors in the terminal building or on the airfield or private facilities on the airport, but we also record and know who went through what door and when. We also know when and where an individual exit the security area. This bill could limit this function if, it, if this simple act was interpreted as tracking. Because of the security nature of this discussion and my obligation to keep our security program on a need to know basis only, I'm reluctant to go further for the discussion of our security systems capabilities in a public forum, but stand ready to meet with the committee uh, in closed session if you would like to discuss this further. I believe I understand the intent of the proposed law is to protect privacy of individuals. I don't come before the committee today to debate this. I come before you to discuss the perhaps unintended consequences of the proposed law. That being limiting New Hampshire's ability to address potential security threats to aviation through technology. RFID tags are used nationwide in aviation on local, state, and federal levels. Passage of this bill in its current form could limit our ability to adopt, modify, or enhance our aviation security program in the future, and may in fact nullify millions of dollars of existing aviation security infrastructure at the Manchester Boston Regional Airport and other facilities. Again, we may be facing a case of unintended consequences here, but I ask you, as a minimum, to consider an amendment which would exempt transportation, air, rail, ports, etc and their security programs from this legislation. Also, please let me make you aware that the Special Committee on Airport Activities, the subcommittee of the Manchester Board of Mayor and Aldermen, voted unanimously to oppose this bill in its current form. This subcommittee recommend recommendation will be heard by the full board <coughs> in the future. And I would be happy to submit a copy of these votes to the committee for your record. In closing, I ask you not to limit our options or to take proven security technology off the table. September 11th demonstrated that terrorists exploit voids in security. I ask you to keep our options open to protect your constituents and our customers. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Good question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, when you said you, the uh, airport employs uh, technology that allows you to track who goes through what doors and areas. Are you talking about airport per personnel with tag on already? I mean, a visible? Oh. Yes, air airport personnel, tenants, uh, and one of the concerns that I have about the existing legislation it talks about public facilities, public buildings. We, our security system not only controls access to public buildings, but also to the airfield itself. We also have what's called a through the fence operation, which could be privately owned facilities not publicly owned by the city of Manchester or any other public entity, <coughs> but their security system is required or mandated to be part of our security system. Okay. Just a quick follow-up. I, I guess I'm just trying to establish, if I go in to the airport, you can't track me. I mean, you're tracking no, your own personnel. No, and no. So, okay. All right. The RFID tag is embedded in this identification card, and only those that have been issued the identification card. They all card. know they've got it. Okay. They all know they've got it. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I was just, just to clarify further, and, and I'm not sure if it's part of what you can go into publicly or would rather go into privately, but is it only the use of the tags that you are concerned with, or are you concerned with additional limitations beyond that method? No, thank you for asking. Right. No, there's, there's much more beyond this that I prefer not to go to in this forum. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I'm going to make an executive decision and ask that you pass out those sandwiches. We regret that we have to eat in front of you, but if we don't, we will not finish. Some people have to leave at 1.30 anyway, so I cannot imagine that we will be going beyond that. We have 14 speakers left to go, and uh, if you've heard it before, you don't have to repeat it. Jim DeMurray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm here today on behalf of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America and also the National Card Coalition, which is an organization comprised of 15 credit card issuers from around the country. Um, both organizations are in support of the amendment that Representative Finnessy presented to you and opposed to the bill as passed uh, by the House. And I, I first want to say, as a former member of the RFID Study Commission, that um, I think the commission, which you authorized through legislation, has been working extremely hard to find areas of common ground. And the Finnessy Amendment are the two areas that the commission has unanimously agreed um, should move forward. The commission is also working on language uh, to try to come up with a labeling uh, provision that everybody, or at least the majority, can agree with. They've had two work sessions on that. They are scheduled to come back at the end of April to continue working in that area. And I think that progress has been made, but as you'll hear from other people today, uh, the Commission is not ready to present and has not voted on any final version, and they're not ready to embrace a labeling provision yet. Um, I think, first and foremost, it's important to realize that this bill goes beyond radio frequency identification devices. This issue started out as an RFID uh, study, but the language that is in this bill um, is much broader. And if you look under the definition now of what's called a remotely readable device, uh, it covers a lot more technology than just RFID. That definition was not problematic, I believe, for anybody as it relates to human implanting, which is really the only section that it would have applied to that came from the commission. But if you are to take that definition and apply it to labeling, uh, based on that definition, I believe you would also be mandating uh, specific labeling for New Hampshire. If a barcode is on a product, keep in mind that every item you purchase at a grocery store has a barcode that is remotely scanned. Um, so every product that has a barcode would require some type of specific labeling just for New Hampshire. Um, it would definitely include RFID and it would include magnetic stripes that you have on the back of an identification card. I, I went through my wallet this morning to see what I have in my wallet for mag strips. And I have a license from the state of New Hampshire that has one. I have two credit cards that have one. I have a Southwest Airlines frequent flyer card that has one. I have a medical identification card that has one. All of these cards would have to be reissued with a specific disclosure relating to New Hampshire. And let me add that there is no state in the country that has adopted a labeling requirement at this point. There are a good half dozen states that have looked at the issue of RFID, that are continuing to look at the issue of RFID, but I think they've come up with the same concerns that you're going to hear today that has put them in a position of not adopting a labeling requirement um, at this time. And so I won't speak to this, but somebody will shortly. Senator Gottesman raised the issue about the interstate commerce clause and the possibility that this issue could be unconstitutional. And uh, there is an opinion that you will all be getting a copy of from a legal firm and it will be explained to you, and this issue was actually tested in Colorado on a specific labeling requirement, not RFID, but a different type of labeling requirement, where the court, a federal court, actually did rule that the labeling requirement was unconstitutional because it placed an undue burden on manufacturers, and keep in mind this bill would place the burden on manufacturers who are not placed, who are not uh, located in the state of New Hampshire. So we would be passing a law that tells 49 other states that they must label a product if it's going to find its way into New Hampshire. On top of that, we'd be telling every foreign country that sells its goods and products in New Hampshire 
and manufactures them that they would have to place a label. And I think that clearly would violate the constitutional question that you'll hear about, but it also makes for a very difficult uh, enforcement uh, scenario if that, in fact, is the law. I, um, I, I also just want to touch on the, the concept that a one-size-fits-all label or disclosure would work for every business or industry, and quite frankly, it won't. Uh, we have got, first, the, the commission, I believe, has heard that less than 1% of consumer products today have RFID chips either in them or attached to them. Um, some of the chips are used for inventory control purposes. Some of the chips are used for storing of personal identifying information. Some of the chips are used for controlling counterfeit products. But you will hear in a little while testimony that one good example is the pharmaceutical industry. Their labeling is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And there are no rules or regulations in effect that would allow for any deviation from the way they approve labels today. So you have a potential conflict that already develops between federal oversight of some products and a state law if this were to pass. So in conclusion, because I know there's a lot of people to speak for this, I think that it makes sense at this point to allow the commission to continue to do its work because they are working on this particular issue. And they voted 14 to 3 to conceptually endorse the idea of labeling. So the project now is for them to come up with something that they could propose to the legislature. I think the, the commission is committed to working on this, uh, and we believe that we should allow them to continue to do their work. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Okay. Thank Leslie you. Wood and Jeff Francis. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Leslie Wood, and I'm Director of State Policy at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Our companies research and develop new medicines, and as they receive Food and Drug Administration approval, they bring these medicines to uh, patients. We do understand the intent of this bill is to protect consumer privacy. However, we do oppose House Bill uh, 686 um, especially because of the labeling requirements for many of the reasons that Mr. Demers just mentioned. At present in our industry, um, radio frequency identification or RFID is not widely used. Some companies are using it though, mostly at the pallet level or at the case level for security reasons to authenticate medicines um, and to make, prevent the um, introduction of counterfeit medicines into the drug supply. Because the RFID uh, device would be affixed by the manufacturer, it does not contain any patient identifiable information. Also, most pharmaceuticals are repackaged by the pharmacist. For example, a pharmacist might have a larger bottle that it would dispense uh, the prescribed amount of pills into and then give that to the patient. And that would never contain an RFID device. As Mr. Demers did mention, our labeling requirements are in fact governed by the Food and Drug Administration, and a medicine cannot be sold unless the labeling is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Right now, the FDA is looking at many security measures for medicines and will likely pass on regulations uh, to further strengthen security of medicines. Uh, we do expect um, the FDA will uh, go ahead and issue rules and regulations, but we're not sure what they're going to look at like at this time. Um, with that, I'd like to turn things over to my coll colleague, uh, Mr. Duff Spencer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jeff Prancer. I'm uh, Assistant General Counsel at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Prior to joining Pharma, I was Associate Chief Counsel at the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, this bill raises special concerns for the biopharmaceutical industry, which, as Ms. Wood mentioned, is highly regulated by the FDA, and the FDA is now under a statutory mandate
to develop uh, additional counterfeiting, uh, anti-counterfeiting technology within the next two years. And uh, Congress has not dictated whether that would be RFID or barcodes or other technologies. However, um, the federal government is taking the lead in trying to protect the pharmaceutical supply from all of the internet fraud that you see online. Um, secondly, and as Mr. Chairman, you mentioned, any state-specific labeling requirement raises special concerns and especially a constitutional question under the Commerce Clause. Under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, one state may not burden interstate commerce. That's the reason why every state doesn't have its own version of labeling, whether it's on your Poland spring water or whether it's on uh, vitamins or drugs. That would create utter chaos um, on the bottles and, uh, and for consumers. And that's the reason why Congress has stated that the FDA should control um, federal for, uh, the, the labeling for pharmaceuticals and for food for the entire country. Um, the case that the chairman uh, mentioned was directly on point to this. And, uh, and the case was Bioganic Safety Brands versus Amant in Federal District Court in Colorado. And I'm just going to read a paragraph from that uh, hearing, and then uh, I know there are several other speakers, and we'll be happy to answer questions. But uh, that court stated that designing special labels and advertisements for the Colorado market substantially raises the cost of business, business in a number of ways. In addition to the costs associated with developing the alternative labels and advertisements, Bioganic and its customers would be forced to segregate Colorado-only product from the non-Colorado product to ensure that the correct items are shipped to the correct markets. The option is costly and less efficient. For that reason, that district court struck down uh, that law under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. And I think there's a decent chance that a federal district court would strike down this law as well. Um, and um, with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you testify in front of the House Committee? Yes, I did. One of you did. I did. Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we do have um, a handout of our statement if you'd like that, as well as more information about the Commerce Clause. Sure, I just leave it here. Ashley Anderson. We represent uh, major manufacturers of over-the-counter medicine. Um, in the interest of time, I will just echo largely what um, Pharma just said about the preemption arguments uh, regarding the FDA and add one additional comment. Um, over-the-counter medicines are regulated slightly differently um, because of the packaging. And some drugs that are approved under what's called a new drug application um, the packaging is, the drug is approved and not only as the medicine itself in that particular formulation, but also including the packaging. So something that comes to mind is the weight loss drug Ally. You'll notice in the drugstore, it comes with a booklet and all kinds of other instructions. That's to make it easier for ordinary consumers to use on an over-the-counter basis. So that drug, for example, is approved by the FDA as not only the formulation of that drug, but also all of the packaging that comes with it. So something like that, you could see, would be very much preempted by the FDA regulation if there was an additional labeling or notice requirement um, for the state of New Hampshire alone. And then with that, thank, thank you. Thank you. For thank you for respecting the other view. We appreciate it. Ken uh, Coffey? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. With your approval, I'd like to offer this article by the National Network to End Domestic Violence. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I am a citizen of New Hampshire. I live in Andover. I am not here representing a company. I'm a wife, a mother, 
and a volunteer EMT in my community. I am greatly concerned um, that this bill will not pass. As a wife and as a mother, I am concerned about the safety of myself, my child, and the women in my community. This type of technology allows for tracking whether we like it or not. With this type of technology comes a great deal of responsibility. In the same situation with um, labeling on products that say file language, I can see a parental notification label, a simple sticker. And I know that many companies were not happy to be made to put a sticker on those products. But it happened. Every state that sells cigarettes has a unique stamp at the bottom of that cigarette pack that says New Hampshire or Massachusetts, all individual to a personal state, and the companies have dealt with that. I'm concerned, that I, and I understand that companies don't want to issue labels for our state, but I'm concerned that if people don't know that this information is in a product they're buying, they're setting themselves up to be victims. It is a known fact that stalkers will use every tool at their demise. If we allow tracking devices to be in their credit cards, in their driver's licenses, and I'm not sure if New Hampshire's thinking about doing that, but if we allow that and all of that information is there, then essentially our government is allowing an impromptu database for stalkers to be able to utilize to find their victims yet again. Our Attorney General's office here in the state of New Hampshire is a wonderful venue for protecting women who have been victimized. And they do everything within their power to protect women's privacy, keep the locations of their living environments secret so these stalkers can't re-find them and re-victimize them. This technology has the ability to undermine that. In the same token, it has the ability to put us all at risk. If a criminal, and we all know criminals don't follow laws, wants to track to find their victim, what's to stop them from getting a scanner and scanning my home and knowing what products I have? or scanning my person and knowing what's in my purse or on my body. I'm a cancer survivor as well. What's to stop someone from scanning my purse and know what type of medication I'm carrying to say I had cancer again? Would I want that to be a known fact? Or if I was carrying some other medication for pain control, would that then become a known fact of what I'm carrying because of some kind of a device in the product? I don't think that it's a large thing to ask for a simple label that gives me the choice as a woman, as a mother, to choose whether or not I want to buy that product. Or at least give me the option to know that it's there and perhaps with this technology they will create some kind of way of canceling it out before I leave the store that I'll know to bring it to the front and say, hey, can you, can you cancel this thing just like they do with security devices? This type of thing, it's wonderful. I understand they want to track their inventory and I can relate to that. I can understand inventory controls. But if you put at it, the, with all things, you always have to consider the evil effects that can have. You can have the good and the bad. The evil that can be done with this type of technology could be far-reaching. We are putting women at risk. We are putting our children at risk. And I greatly ask you that you support this bill, that you pass this legislation, and allow us to simply have a label. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Senator Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What do you think about the airport uh, manager's uh, conversation as far as the security of the people getting on those airplanes? Well, he was talking about an employee identification tag. As an employee with a company, I work in a hospital environment, I'm issued a tag. I have the ability to leave that in my locker and leave. I don't have to carry that device with me. He's talking about an ID tag for employees. So it still comes down to choice. I know it's there. If I choose to work there and have the tag, well, then that's my choice. But if we're putting things in items and we don't know what's there, then the choice is removed from me as the individual. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julie, will you do? Good afternoon. My name is Julie Ledoux, and I'm here to represent not only myself, but a group of Hall's residents who are watching us very closely, one of whom is my husband, Mark Ledoux, who is a selectman and also with the next generation of young people who very likely will not understand or even comprehend the kind of privacy that you and I grew up with. They're losing it. The very fact that they've said that everything I've heard is talking about society where technology is so incredibly intertwined that it's proving the point. It's proving the point that we're losing right under our noses the very freedoms that we value, and at least I hope we value. And I think the same system that creates drugs and uh, devices and an incredible business opportunity in this country can create ways 
It's a label. It's a question of motivation. It's a question of who leads and makes it a compelling interest. I'm here to speak in favor of 686 because some sec technologies are like the content <coughs> of the words box. Once opened and they're released, they cannot be contained. They become ubiquitous. Over time, consumers are lulled into complacency, and when they realize that they've sacrificed their freedom and privacy for the sake of convenience or because they were afraid of terrorism or something else, it's too late to put the genie back into the bottle. I'm glad there's only 1% at this point because we have time to act in terms of how ubiquitous RFID passive and active tags are, but it's important we act now. This bill is very sensible and reasonable accommodation to protect the compelling privacy and freedom rights and body integrity rights, which are the interests of our citizens. RFID chips are like the Trojan horses of the retail world. I don't want a Trojan horse following me home. I've already purchased numerous products that have the active RFID chips in them. My children have found them. I purchased in good faith to support corporations, to support retailers, to support pharmacy companies, only to find out that there were essentially spy chips sent home in my product, hidden under layers of packaging. I really think it is a reasonable demand to demand that I know what I'm buying and bringing home. Again, this is America. If we're motivated to solve a problem, we can. Where food is labeled, chemicals are labeled, almost everything we consume is labeled. My McDonald's <coughs> coffee cup is labeled. Certain labels say that there's sales tax in one, one um, state and not in another. Like she mentioned the stamps on cigarettes. One easy way would be to label across the country. If any drug company or any uh, consumer or retail or manufacturer really had the interests of the citizens of the country, in mind, they could simply label their products wholesale. But you see, it's about money. And it shocks me that a company thinks that it's such a huge burden to label a product that's going to come into someone else's home that has such potential for abuse. That tells me that the company doesn't have the consumers in mind. They have a, a bottom line dollar issue in mind. So I want to ask, who's going to lead? Okay, right now maybe the laws are leaning a certain way on the commerce issue. But somebody has to lead. And those laws need to be really looked at. And, and if we sit back and say, oh, well, it's not going to happen because somebody's going to litigate it, then we've lost the opportunity to lead and to create a compelling motivation for the corporations of the United States to put their nose to the grindstone and find ways to label, to protect. That is only reasonable when you think about the astronomical potential for the abuse and misuse of this incredible technology. The only reason not to label for FID sometimes seems that big businesses lobby hard against it because consumers very often will not purchase items that are labeled with an RFID tag from the studies that we know that consumers are not happy about that. And it is really your highest responsibility as our representatives to protect the precious privacy rights and bodily integrity rights of basic, simple individuals like me, like the others here, like my kids, your kids, over and above the national and multinational interests of big business. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, Claire Ebel. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Claire Eagle. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. And to the surprise of no one in the room, we support the bill and oppose the opposition. I will try to be very brief, Senator, because I know that there are others waiting to speak. Every time a legislative body has been asked to put a label on a product to inform consumers about what it does or does not contain, what it is or is not, there is opposition because the people producing the products don't want to do it. In part, I think, because they don't want you to know what's in there. It's the, it's the old idea of not watching the making of sausage. You're better off not knowing what it is. But what you're hearing today is not opposition to the bill, it's opposition to the work. For example, um, the testimony of the gentleman from the Manchester airport uh, really isn't relevant to this bill because, at least what he said here, there may be other things that are. On page 4, line 11, 
electronic tracking, electronic tracking prohibited. May, no person may track either with a, without a court order or the consent of the person being tracked. The employees wearing those tags have given their consent to be tracked. So that piece of information is not relevant to this bill. It's already an exception. All we are asking for in this bill is that you give us notice. We're not asking them to stop putting RFID chips in things. We're simply saying, give me the, give me the ability to say no if I don't want it. I don't have an easy pass thing. The reason I don't have one is because I knew it was going to be used for tracking and I don't like the government tracking me, so I still pay money at the tolls. I have a fortune in tokens if anybody is interested <laughs> in purchasing those. With regard to the pharmacy labels, most of what was said is also not relevant because again, in the bill, on page 2, line 20, 29 to 32, a consumer product or identification document to which a device has been implanted, intended or offered for sale or provided to a consumer. The medicines the pharmacists get may be tracked and they would not offend this bill. It is the, the prescription given to the individual that we are talking about, not the medicine given to the pharmacist. You can track that under this bill, there is no problem because the 100 or 200 or 500 bottle that the pharmacist then dispenses your prescription from can be tracked. It's the prescription for 10 or 20 that we are opposing. <coughs> this bill is simply asking you, as our representatives, to give us the information we need to make informed decisions. The companies who are affected may in fact oppose it because it puts a somewhat more burdensome part on their manufacturing process. But we have gone through the battles over what is or is not organic, about listing the elements in our food, about giving us information about trans fat and cholesterol. All of those items were fought tooth and nail by the industries that were impacted. And it hasn't brought them down. They are still feeding us and making the products. I urge you to give consumers in New Hampshire the ability to make intelligent, reasoned choices about whether we want our homes and our persons tracked with RFID chips. And I would just um, point out that I will research the Colorado case. It doesn't sound as if that case was appealed. And so a 2001 case in one federal district of the United States of America has no precedential value anywhere but there. I will find out, Mr. Chair, if it's been appealed. If it has, I'll get you a copy of the appeal. Thank you. Now, we're going to hold questions now. We have uh, about 10 people to go. We have, 10, we have uh, 20 minutes. I want everybody to be next to you. Uh, Kathleen, Carol, and, no, no, no. And, and folks, uh, the, we, we know how you've signed up. I will be glad to read into the record. If this becomes a part of the record, the rest of the people are pretty much in opposition. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. I'm sorry it's short shrift, but this is all we've got. So, Captain, <laughs> Two minutes, I hope, to keep us here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today, Kathleen Carroll, Director of Government Relations for HID Global. We are a manufacturer of radio frequency technology, and I am a certified information privacy professional. I am here today re representing HID Global and millions of users of our technology, many of them who live and work right here in New Hampshire. As a leading provider of secure access and identity management, we're committed to the security and privacy of our end users who have issued to date more than 300 million credentials worldwide with no reported abuses. HID Global opposes House Bill 686 for the following reasons, all of which are based on fact. The bill as amended is flawed for many reasons. I will outline just a few in the interest of time. Page one, line 22, section three, part B. Quote, this product contains a remotely readable device that can be read without your knowledge if it is brought within range of a reading reader device. Nowhere in this bill is there a definition of remotely readable. Does remotely readable mean 
one inch, 24 inches, five feet, 30 feet. To clarify my question, I will use a real world example. My access control badge does not need to touch or pass through a reader to be read, but my badge can only be read from a few inches away. In fact, I challenged two hackers to read my access control badge when I was wearing it clipped to the waistband of my skirt. Since I was in a public place, I kept my badge out of view. I recommended best practice for all of our end users if they wear their badges in public, which they are not required to do. The hackers were unable to read my badge. They would have had to know exactly where it was on my person and then place the reader in the exact same area within inches, something I'm sure I would have noticed. My colleague and I demonstrated this fact to the RFID study commission here in New Hampshire. Um, they saw for themselves that it's not possible to read these, the, you know, the tag unless they get literally, they, they practically have to touch it. Um, we actually, we're, we're very grateful to the commission that's done some fine work and they're, they're very reasonable and they listen to you. Um, uh, two, page two, line 23, set, uh, section seven. Real-time or near-real-time tracking of individuals carrying or wearing radio frequency based devices is not possible except in closed systems where readers placed throughout a building, for example, um, would, um, would be able to track someone. So, for example, the gentleman from the airport where he talked about the, the badges there, yes, they can track the employees while they are at the airport and, and they're you know, working. Once they leave that airport, even if they carry that badge with them, nobody can find them based on that badge. No one can find them. Um, just based on the RFID badge. The same is true for infants in hospitals. They use RFID tags to protect infants in hospitals from being taken out of the hospital, kidnapped. Um, if, a if a child were to be kidnapped wearing that badge, the, the RFID badge, they could not find the child uh, based on the, on the tag, unfortunately. Uh, they would, it would have to be like um, GPS or something like that, so you can't track that way. Um, even if an individual possessed a reader that could read the device outside of that closed environment, that individual would only be able to track the holder of the device by following them, them around with the reader, making the reader unnecessary since they're following them anyway. Ms. Carroll? Yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but we, you know, I got 13 people behind you. Okay. Uh, is, there, is there something you can submit to us? Yeah, I do. I actually have something to submit to you. Um, I, I, said, I, I really don't want to see yeah. that we go through 10 more pages. Now, well, it's, it's really me. big if I can't see. <laughs> so so, could you just sum I got three up for, pages. Could you just sum up for us sure. and submit comments? Here, three please. pages. Um, I do, okay, um, just want to make the point that, um, that because no one has addressed the um, issuance of uh, government identification documents, um, that contrary to what the, uh, the testimony from the ACLU was, this bill would ban the issuance of uh, documents containing RFID by, by state agencies, state government. Um, it would do that, and that would be um, significantly a problem. I'll, I'll just tell you um, this one thing, and then that's it. Um, the bill would, re um, would uh, preclude first responders in the state of New Hampshire from participating in a nationwide emergency preparedness program. Um, it would um, to have serious implications for the airports, it would... Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Oh. We understand. Okay, all right. Um, and then finally, we support, a could global and a lot of our customers, we support banning the forced implantation. We support the Tennessee and the amendments. Okay. So, we're good to go. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I know you made a trip to be here. Uh, Happy Cody Brimbalist. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry to be so curt with people. I just don't, I don't want to be. I, 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 We're good. Okay. We're good. Some people will have to leave. We're going to hear this till the end. So. Uh, for the record, my name is Jody Grimbalis. I'm here on behalf of the General Motors and Lone Star. I have passed out a letter which gave submitted to the RFID Study Commission. So it's here for your review. Two basic issues General Motors does disclose RFID in our owner's manuals, the use of RFID in cars. Um, this bill, it, they would not comply with this bill as it's written. Uh, two, for OnStar, some of the services that we provide in OnStar would also be prohibited by this bill. Um, that's also discussed in the letter, and uh, we hope it gets further discussion at the commission level. 
Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Curtis Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have um, a statement in full that I will submit to the, to the committee. I'd like to just make a couple of points about retailing generally, a couple of points about RFID generally. And You're representing the Retail Merchants Association. I am, thank you. Sure. And then three specific points about the bill. Um, first point about our association, over 90% of our member companies are New Hampshire-based small businesses, which is um, one, one of the groups that we obviously look out for. Many people just assume it's the large retailers. Um, second, um, I think it's, it's important to remember that customer loyalty is one of the most important things to a retailer. If a retailer loses its customer loyalty, they will, at best, walk away in droves. I don't believe any retailer, large or small, would do anything that would violate the loyalty or the trust of a customer. And if they do, they would suffer the consequences. That said, on RFID generally, as it's been said, widespread utilization is many years away, very small percentage is in the stream of commerce. Um, we believe a state-by-state -state method of labeling poses many problems. Some have already been outlined, uh, particularly for a state with our size, with less than one half of one percent of the nation's population. Um, and, and generally, lastly, to scan an RFID device, as I understand it, in a consumer product, does not readily give you what the product is. It gives you, at best, a string of numbers if it's not encrypted, if you have the right tools and the right frequency, et cetera. On this bill specifically, um, Section 4, Mr. Chairman, this is what you referenced at the very beginning of the hearing. There's a section that deals with labeling generally. Section 4 on the last page, page 5, line 10, amends what would be the consumer labeling section to add in what's called frequency and data structure. I know what a frequency is. I'm not really sure I know what a data structure is. But I think the point is, too, <coughs> one, this would definitely create a New Hampshire-specific label. And then you get into the problems which you've heard before. Either it, it'll be more costly, or New Hampshire stores and New Hampshire consumers may not receive the benefit of being able to buy these items in New Hampshire. A manufacturer who ships nationally or globally may choose just not to ship to New Hampshire. Um, but as I understand those yes. terms, as, a, as I briefly heard them previously, if you, if you tell them there's a transponder, if you tell them there's a frequency, and you tell them the data structure, and somebody who, who actually did want to track the person would have all the information necessary to track the person at that time. Another very good point. Yes, sir. Okay. So we oppose this section. The second of three very specific objections is the effective date. My understanding is typically when the federal government through law or rule imposes a labeling requirement, it's at least 18 months out. Many times it's more. There are obvious reasons why they do this. There are items left on the shelf and so forth. So we would ask for, at the very least, um, a longer effective date. What has been proposed to the study commission is, in fact, a sunrise, which when a, a threshold is met in a certain percentage of items in the stream of commerce has an RFID device, or whatever we're going to call it, then the law becomes effective, and there are other ways to accomplish that sort of a sunrise concept. Um, and lastly, this bill um, includes only a label on the product as the only option for consumer notice. We believe that um, there should be flexibility and alternatives to that, as you heard testimony before. One size does not fit all. In some cases, a label may not be appropriate um, or even readable. So we would ask for flexibility if um, language was, were to go forward. Um, I know we're not taking Quickly questions. But question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ed Dupont was here. He's on the hallway. If he wants to come in. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is John Dumas, for the record. I'm president and CEO of the Grocers Association in the state of New Hampshire. We represent both the supermarkets and the convenience stores and mom and pop stores, all food stores. I'm also a member of this commission, and I've been from the beginning on that. And I just would like to say that uh, I, for one, uh, would like to see the commission's work continue and go through. We were challenged by that, by the, this general court. Uh, two years ago, the governor signed it into law. We've been meeting diligently trying to get some information passed. 
and we're finding how complex it really is. That's why it's taking so long. But we have made some headway, and the Finnessy Amendment was the proper vehicle bringing it forward. It means that we've thoroughly researched those issues, and those are the ones that we can agree upon. We're into labeling and notification now, and I would hope that you allow us to continue our work rather than bringing something that, that may not work right. One example is that the, the original discussions we had on RFID was what is the, the term of RFID, and, and should we be looking at radio frequency identification tags? Along the line, it got changed to remotely readable devices. And the current legislation you have before you is, is so broad that it could construe to be a lot of other things, including barcodes on anything. And everything has a barcode today. But it means anything that's, that's remotely readable. So it's a very broad spectrum. It's too broad for what we're trying to accomplish here. And that's just one of the flaws in the current bill you have in front of you. So I would urge this committee to look at this legislation seriously and most importantly, look at the Finnessy Amendment. And if we anything, we, 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 we believe in privacy as an industry. We believe in security. But we also believe that we want to pass it that, that works right. And certainly passing the Finnessy Amendment would do that. Um, the other thing that we're concerned about as a grocery industry, as most of the merchants are, and we concur with a lot of what the merchants, uh, what Curtis Barry had said and uh, uh, Mr. Demers had said earlier, is that uh, we're concerned about cross-border sales. 40% of our sales are from out of state, and if we don't have the products because they're not labeled, they, they won't do it from New Hampshire because it's such a small incident of an amount of product, we're not going to have that available and they're going to go across the border. The best example of that is fire safe cigarettes. When we went one month before Massachusetts in implementing fire safe cigarettes, it drove the sales across the border to Massachusetts, and for every percentage point that we've lost in New Hampshire, Massachusetts gained. They came a month later with it, but we never gained those sales back. That's revenue to the state. The state's losing. But it's not just tobacco. It's the related products that go with it. It's the lottery tickets, the beer, the wine, meal tax, everything we do, gasoline. All of those things are affected by what you do with this. And so we hope you look at this very seriously, as we have on the commission, and put back the Finnessy Amendment. We've done that much work already, and we'd like to have the opportunity to finish our work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, just for the record, I just want to know, Ed DuPont was here earlier. He represents Motorola Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers, and he was opposed to legislation. Uh, Allison Fleming. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for your time today. My name is Allison Fleming. I represent EPC Global. We are a not-for-profit standards organization uh, that sets the standards for RFID use. I think you've heard today, and we are also a member of the New Hampshire RFID Commission. I think you've heard all the reasons today that we oppose the bill. I have a written, written statement for you to review. In our minds, we would like you to respectfully ask you to reject uh, the House Bill uh, 686 and to approve the uh, Tennessee Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Tracy. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Stuart Tracy representing Chain Pharmacy. Our concerns about the retail issues have been already addressed, and also the prescription and over-the-counter drug issues have also been addressed. Uh, we do support the work of the commission and hope you will look at the Finnesy Amendment as what you would go forward with, and we do support that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, whoops. Alusik. Are you, are you gonna speak? Just for a second. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't have you speaking. That's, I appreciate that, thank, thank you. you. My name's Lauren Alusik. Thank you. My name is Lauren Lusick. I'm the Northeast Director of State Affairs for the Grocery Manufacturers Association. That's an association of food, beverage, and consumer products manufacturers. Um, we're opposed to the bill that's before the committee. We are in support of the Commission's uh, amendment, which is also represented uh, Finnessy's amendment. Uh, this is something that, as you guys have learned today and probably before this, this is a complicated issue, and every action that's taken has multiple ramifications, and it's difficult for even the Commission to properly address those. As commission decisions have been made, people from outside the commission have come in and said, hey, that actually affects us. So we support the commission to continue its work and we'll support, we oppose the uh, bill to avoid. Great, thank you. Okay. Chris Williams. I only have one other speaker. Great. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for your patience this afternoon and for the opportunity to visit with you for just a minute. I will keep my comments incredibly brief uh, and simply reiterate that you've already heard much expert testimony on this. And I'm not going to shed any new insight that you haven't already heard today. Just tell us who you are and who you represent. Chris Williams with the Greater Nashua Chamber of Commerce, and I'm representing BAE Systems, Colesman, Oracle, and Nashua Court, who have a specific interest in this issue. Two of those companies are actually on this RFID commission. And I told them I would express their uh, concerns over this bill as it's currently formatted and ask that you either send it to interim study or support Representative Finnessy's amendment. Thank you very much. I'll turn some written testimony in. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since we're short on time, I'll just get my fancy introduction, and I would like to just address some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did you introduce yourself? I did here? not. Thank you. My, for the record, my name is Joel Winters. I represent Hillsborough District 17. It's Manchester District 10, 11, and 12. And as a member of the House Commerce Committee, I served on the subcommittee um, working on this bill. And we've worked on it in commerce for over a year now. And I'm here today to ask for your support. Um, I'd like to explain once again where this, this language came from. Um, this was the work of the Senate Public Municipal Affairs Committee uh, two years ago. What they had recommended, no further reintroduced. And what we've done is combined that language with the Finnesy Amendment and put those two together. That is what the language that we have in front of us. Um, I'd also like to clarify in the bill what items are required to be labeled. Anything that's used um, behind the, in the stock room, anything that's used for inventory control does not have to have a label. The only Where's time the labeling, I'm sorry? Where's it say that? Um, in the definition of, well, the, on uh, page one, line six and seven, the definition of consumer um, makes it very clear that the only products that are defined as consumer products are ones that are used by an individual in the state of New Hampshire who uses them for personal, non-commercial reasons. Businesses are still free to use RFID without any sort of labeling. But at the point that they sell them to a consumer, and that consumer product has an RFID tag that is now part of its, the essential use of that product, the consumer has to be notified. So, I guess uh, it sort of begs the question, doesn't it? Because if they can use it up till they, they send it to the doorway, once it goes out the door, it's supposed to become something else. Uh, well, the example that the pharmaceutical industry gave, where they get a big container of 500 pills with an RFID tag. The, the, when I go to pick up my prescription, I get a small container of, of five pills with no RFID tag. Right, but it, you know, I, I found things in my clothing, so I buy it. I walk out the door, it's still in my clothing. Right, and if that is being sold to you? Um, so once I walk out the door, even though it was inventory on the inside, once I walk out the door, do they, what I'm asking you is, are you saying that they have to have a way to deactivate it or remove it? No, if, if it is a, a product that is sold to you, yes, it has to be labeled. But the way the technology is, is used mostly today is for pallets. You've got a big pallet, a uh, case of you know, toothpaste, you wrap it up in shrink wrap, right? stick an RFID tag on the side of it. There's no label on requirement. It's only the products that are sold to the end consumers that are required to be labeled so that a consumer can make an educated choice. Um, the Commerce Clause issue was one that was brought up in the, the, the House. And you know, I talked to a practicing attorney. I looked at our existing laws. Um, the Fire Safe Cigarette Laws says very clearly that no person shall manufacture cigarettes that don't have a symbol that says fire safe. Um, so this was sort of modeled on our existing law. If there are concerns that this would violate the Interstate Commerce Clause, um, the solution is to, to mirror the language that's in many of our other statutes that says no person shall manufacture, sell, offer for sale, and completely cover all the transactions that would occur here in the country. And that would, that would solve any uh, Commerce Clause issues, if in fact there are any. The uh, Department of Transportation Amendment was also brought up in the House. It's the one that would allow the pass transmitters to be tracked at different points on the highway. Um, I did introduce that and bring that forward in the subcommittee, and the subcommittee defeated the amendment. We did not feel it appropriate for the state to be tracking uh, cars on the highways. 
we built the stage to be um, reading easy pass transmitters at the actual tokens. So I would encourage you to impose uh, that on them. Some of the problems that have cropped up in this bill are because we attempted to please everybody. Uh, the RFID Commission said they didn't like the phrase RFID. They wanted them to be known as remotely readable devices. So we went back and we changed every uh, instance of RFID or tracking device and changed it to the phrase remotely readable device. Now GM is concerned with their notice which says this car uses RFID doesn't meet the requirement. Um, well, we all know we're never going to please everybody. We are not. And I, I tried to please too many people with this bill, and uh, some people are still upset. Again, the, the concern that Curtis Berry brought up about the notice requirement, which requires the frequency of data structure, um, that was the language that came out of the Senate Public and Municipal Affairs Committee. That was the language that passed the House two years ago. What we've done by pushing that requirement off until 2013 is allow a phase-in period where, um, where a simpler logo can be used without all that information. And the reason that we want consumers to be able to have that information is so that they, when they do buy a product with a hidden RFID tag, they know how to react to it. That's what we want. To, that's the information we want consumers to be able to have. Um, very little from the Bankers Association uh, has a letter that's been sent to me and I'd like to submit to the, the committee um, with a couple of concerns of this bill. And I support his, his recommendations in here. Uh, he would just like to clarify that uh, personal information such as banking and credit card um, information, banking and credit card numbers are not owned by the individual. That information is actually owned by the, the banks or the credit card companies. Um, he'd also like to clarify that when the state issues credit cards um, on, has credit cards issued on its behalf that contain our it's okay to, um, that those credit cards contain more than just a unique ID number. And um, his third point is the definition of remotely readable device. And remember there was a little bit of, of confusion on maybe the definition that's in this bill now is too broad. Again, trying to please everyone, I took the definition that the, the commission had proposed in the second of the bill. He suggests going back to the original definition of tracking device that was in the bill as introduced and was passed by the Senate committee last year. Um, I have no objection to that. Uh, yeah, trying to please everyone, I've created problems. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say this is a good bill. It's a good consumer protection bill that gives customers choices. It allows you when you go into the store to decide if you want to buy a tie that has an RFID tag or one without. You should know, you should be able to make that informed decision. You should. The other parts of the bill that prohibit forced implantation without consent, I think that's a no-brainer. Updating the RFID skimming device, uh, credit card skimming sections of our laws, and that's good common sense um, information. The prohibition on electronic tracking. Nobody should be tracking without their consent. If you're an employee, you've given your consent, it's okay. But I don't want people tracking me without telling me about it. And the prohibition on state use, putting RFID in driver's licenses. We don't have a choice about carrying a driver, carrying driver's license. So when that choice is taken away from us, let's say, as the general court, that it is our policy, we're not going to be tracking devices in driver's licenses. So I would ask you to support this bill, and I'd be happy to answer questions or, or work with anyone else who'd like to. Anybody any questions? Thank you. Okay. Let's close the hearing on House Bill 686. Uh, I, I just asked, uh, the only thing I didn't ask you about is whether you wanted to deal with the cigar bars today, which we can do. I'm not sure what the vote is.